as some of you know, I, I studied with, with Dr. Mendes Floor. Um, I'm going to use Paul because I, uh, I've known him. I don't know if you know this, Paul, but it's, it's been 25 years. Um, and so, so Paul was uh, my, my teacher, my, my doctor frater at um, University of Chicago, but I also studied with him at the Hebrew University. Um, he is a world-renowned expert on, on the, the life and thought of Martin Buber, um, also uh, intellectual history, Jewish intellectual history and thought. Um, but I think what's, what's essential for, for us today is also his experience and expertise in um, interreligious dialogue and, and dialogue uh, more generally. Um, some of you might know that, that, that Paul was a protagonist in um, a Baltimore author's book about a, um, about a dialogue between Buddhists and, and Jews in Dharmasala, where the, the Dalai Lama invited a, a number of Jewish luminaries to, to talk about the, the existential situation of, of Jews um, in exile. And, and Paul was one of those, those people. Um, and I, I have photographs to, to prove it. Um, but, <laughs> um, but what I want to do is uh, a number of you took the, the course with me on Martin Buber. Um, it was a six week course on Buber's life and thought. And if those of, and for those of you who missed it, uh, you can go to our YouTube channel um, and, and you can watch. Uh, it's uh, six hours of, of just wonderful discussion. Actually, it's not. It's just me talking. Everybody else was edited out. So maybe you don't want to watch it. Um, <laughs> But that, that's really going to serve as an appetizer for today because um, so Paul is our, our main course. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, Paul's going to talk for forever long Paul wants to about um, Buber's life and thought. But we're, we're, we're hopeful that he'll start at least on what Buber's um, philosophy of dialogue is and why it's a essential, I think, in a contemporary environment and, and really what, what the main part of his um, life of dialogue is. And you can write questions in the chat um, rather than people just asking questions willy-nilly in the Zoom space, put them in the chat and, and we will ask them as they come. Um, and if you don't have questions, that's fine. Um, I have a number of questions that I can ask Paul to, to keep it interesting. And so without further ado, um, Dr. Professor Galerter, Paul Mendes Floor at our service. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Paul. Indeed, welcome. I just have one uh, slight correction <laughs> or reservation. You refer to me as an expert. Experts are in electricity, uh, carpentry, <laughs> in the world of spirit, the world of intellect. You don't have experts. It's a continuous process. Um, and it's a journey I began of well, I'm 81 years old, so it's way back I began the journey, and the journey continues. Um, uh, the, uh, the journey has its, as its objective, not ex uh, expertise, but to deepen one's understanding. I just also like to add that uh, Ben had mentioned that he studied with me for 25 years and earned his doctorate under my guidance uh, at the University of Chicago. So did Heather Miller Rubens. Uh, earned her doctorate with me in Chicago. Uh, and they're both accomplished and exceptionally gifted individuals. And as one says in the Jewish tradition, one should not be envious of one's children or students. Um, it's often translated as having pride. The pride, according to the rabbinic tradition, leaves no room for God or the spirit. Uh, it bloats you up. So we have a different expression in the tradition. And that is, they offer us, my students and my and my children, um, what we call nachat ruach, spiritual gratification. Some of you may know the Yiddish term, nachas, which is, uh, suggests, again, spiritual gratification. Not pride, because pride, we leave, <laughs> bloats our ego, our sense of consciousness, leaving no room, according to rabbis, for God to enter our world. What a life of spirit. I would like to, um, and I'm certain um, Ben had mentioned this, that next year, uh, that is in the year 2023, will mark the 100th anniversary of Buber's, the publication of, in German of Buber's uh, magnum opus, the world, uh, a seminal document that has 
um, that continues to nurture uh, our quest for understanding how we are to live together, not only with ourselves, but with others um, on all levels. And uh, the German term is not really well translated in English, doesn't capture it. It's a simple word, ish, which means I, und, and, and then they use a term that we don't really have in English, at least not in modern English, post Shakespearean English, do. And here I must, you allow me a, a very brief uh, lesson in German. German has two words, as perhaps in, as, as we know in French or Italian, for uh, the second person. The more formal term, which we use all the time, is Z. But there's a little another term for more intimate relations called do, D-U. And that is limited to relationships between parents and children, between uh, the closest of friends. Um, and to give you an example of the weight of that term and what it really sig sign signifies, I will tell you of a relationship that Buber had with a very close person, certainly what Americans would call a pal. And Midwest, I think, even more quickly would say he's a buddy. And that was a man named Franz Olsenstein. They worked together very, very closely on a variety of projects. Their families were befriended. And yet they continued to address one another as Z, this more formal term. After seven years, uh, and particularly as they engaged in translating the Hebrew Bible into German, as they understood it should be translated, Rosenzweig wrote a, a celebratory letter with a poem which he inadvertently, as he said, addressed Buber with that intimate do. And then quickly says, oh, I'm sorry, please. And then Buber returns to him, who was a, almost eight years old, and he said, no, no, don't apologize. We are now, after seven years of intense relationship, we are now ready to address one another for do. What does that entail? And it gives a secret, not a secret, but a, a entree into this ultimate significance of Buber's philosophical legacy. And that is how we achieve trust, the fragility of trust. And that suggests that we peel away all our defenses, all the layers of that we guard our vulnerabilities. After seven years, Buber and Rosenzweig exchanging dozens, if not hundreds of letters, meeting quite frequently, felt they were able to expose their vulnerabilities and to be comfortable with one another, to attain mutual trust. What is significant for Buber is that the Hebrew, the biblical term for, for faith is trust, emunah, trust. And that's why it's translated in the Jewish tradition. Faith is trust. God is the ground of trust. And that's not simple because we know the world is brutal. Look at the events today in Ukraine or here in close. I live in Jerusalem, calling you, speaking to you from Jerusalem. There's a harsh reality of communities that don't trust one another, fearful. There's great deal of pain. Read the Hebrew Bible. Wars. Uh, interpersonal conflict, misunderstanding, and yet we are to affirm that the world that God created is good. And indeed, as you recall from the book of Genesis, not just good, but very good. The rabbis have a reflection on, on that very good, which is astounding. And what does a very good really signify? Death. Life is fragile, ultimately final, brutal, and cause their death, which comes after a long age, but young people die, and often with great agony. And yet we are to affirm life is as good. Uh, and that means the goodness of each other. But that requires us to, to nurture the goodness of life, the goodness of God's creation. You can spell that out in terms of ecological concerns, global warming, and the like. But that's the ground of that little word, do. The challenge to create trust, to overcome mistrust. 
I'll expand upon that if you wish, but let me just say a few more words before I allow you to, or invite you to ask questions regarding trust. The book, uh, I and Val, the word am is crucial. It's and signifies a bridge between one person and the other. And in the world or in the realm of mutual trust. And Buber says very clearly, each of us are in need to be affirmed, to be greeted, embraced with trust. You know, in the Hebrew Bible, it says you should love, which is often translated as your neighbor, to the, degree, to the same degree that you wish to be, be loved. Kamocha. We all are in need of love. In that sense, I am thou, the uh, concept of a dialogue, is not simply ethical. It is a deeply existential moment, if you wish, as Buber emphasizes, a religious moment to live in life with all its fragility and brutality that we all experience. We're all vulnerable. We have various ways of dealing with that. Uh, sometimes we have greater strength to deal with it than others. But we're all in need of mutual relationships of trust. Buber defines trust, excuse me, love as responsibility to one another and respond to one another within the wiles and in, 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 uh, instabilities of life. Um, all relationships, take marriage, right? friendships, always has to be renewed. It's not, it, it's not sealed with marriage, it's not sealed with the marriage contract. It, the contract simply opens up to the challenge of living to, with one another, of nurturing uh, a loving relationship as we march through life together um, with all the uncertainties, all the unanticipated difficulties that we may tra tra uh, experience. In this respect, I'd like to just use, conclude with my opening comments with this, which I think is crucial. How do we relate to another human being within the bounds of this mutual trust that we would call ultimately love, relationship of, relate, of responsibility to one another? to one another, back and forth. Um, and he coined a term, uh, which, uh, which is translated in, in English as inclusion. The German term, Infassung, suggests embracing the other, embracing the story of the other, the life of the other, embracing the woes, the fears, and yet the joys of the other. When I establish a relationship with my wife, we, we very immediately went, began to record our birthdays and everything like that. So when my wife has a birthday, which is coming up shortly, please remind me if I forget, on the 10th of May, <laughs> uh, uh, I rejoice with her. Um, and I, I had recently my birthday, and she rejoiced with me, as well as our grandchildren. Uh, and even my cat got involved somehow <laughs> in, in celebrating my birthday. But I'm just being facetious with that respect. But um, but also the pain and sorrow to weep with one another, to celebrate with one another. And as Buba understands, it's not quite empathy. Empathy suggests projecting your feelings. But what Buba calls umfasum, inclusion, means also experiencing the life of the other as part of your own experience, going back to the end. Um, and that includes, obviously, on an interpersonal level of two individuals or small for your family unit, but also for Buber, the way peoples who are in conflict with one another um, are to enter the reality of the other and bring that reality into one's own experience, not projecting. I'm now completing a little essay that I've been invited to, uh, uh, well, lectures that I've been invited to give with, in the Denmark to good friends on hearing or let's just say listening, what it means to really listen to the other person. And the punchline is <laughs> that you have to, in order to listen to the other, is that you have to cease listening to yourself, filtering out your own experience in order to let the other person's experience and all its dimensions of joyful experiences, pain and fear, the vulnerabilities of the other, allowing them to enter your world without interpreting, Filtering out your own experience in order that to leave to give room for the other 
Uh, and that just goes a two way, obviously. Uh, I, I, you know, I can be wide open about it. I live in a very contentious world. It, the, we call it the holy world, a land, but that's oxymoron on the, <laughs> on the day to day level. It's a land of great conflict, hardly holy in the way we, uh, the peoples of this land, um, dwell together or fail to, to dwell together. I'm speaking, of course, of the Palestinian Arabs who are Christian and Muslim and the Jews. We both have strong feelings of attachment and, and difficulty in accommodating our mutual attachment to this land. We all have our own story. Uh, in a few days in Israel, we'll be noting the Holocaust memorial. Um, the Jews carry a great deal of pain. Um, but the Palestinians also have pain of being excluded in a land that they've been here, residing in for, for centuries. Many probably are descendants of Jews, of biblical Jews, but nonetheless, uh, they have their own attachments, their own understanding of, of this land. Um, and we re really fail to listen to one another. We exchange accusations about our own experience. We go through a litany of, you've done this to me, and this is what I feel. And, that's not really what dialogue's about. Learning to listen to one another and to honor the inner reality of the other, the existential, if you wish to put it in those terms, reality of the other, and to in include it within your own understanding. Dialogue does not lead us to a, a solution, but it leads us to a perspective of how we may learn to live with one another. And again, one last term. Um, but, but Although German was not his initial language, but he spoke, he developed his philosophy through German. Uh, in German, you have a term called, I'll, I'll just use a German term, then it translated, neben aneinander, living by ex to one another, besides one another. And Buber says that's not the solution. The solution is to learn how to mit einander, to live with one another. And dialogue is a perspective uh, of how to live with one another without denying your own existence. Remember the name of the book is I and Thou. You don't negate your I in order to honor the, uh, your partner in life, but you expand your understanding of yourself through the eyes and pain and joy, worldview or sensibilities of the other. I and Thou. That is brief, my understanding of Buber. And I go back to what I said before, and there's no experts in the world of spirit. It's an ongoing journey of, of understanding. Understanding Buber, but on this ultimately understanding oneself, understanding how to live in a fruitful, affirmative way. And if you wish to use the religious language, biblical, how to glorify God's creation. Um, the Jewish tradition, which is, of course, articulated, excuse me, in the Islamic and uh, Christian experience, we are partners in God and creation. Um, there's a very beautiful um, rabbinic reflection we call midrash. Um, regarding the term that you all undoubtedly know, shalom, peace, is the Arabic equivalent of it, but it's the, the root term is to complete something. Creation is not completed uh, or peace is not achieved unless we participate in God in creating uh, the uh, encroachments so or the, the matrix, the, the, let's use another term, the, way, the weave of relationships we would call peace. Uh, we are to understand ourselves religiously speaking as part of God in the process of completing creation, such that we really could say there's peace on all levels. Remember the book of Isaiah? A wolf and a lamb will dwell together. A child will be able to walk in the, in the presence of a lion without fear. That is overcoming the, the fundamental uh, um, contradictions as we experience it between the animal world, if you wish, that God created as well in the human world, all those contradictions. And of course, the most glorious moment is in Isaiah's vision, we will take our spears, our instruments of, of war, war, and smash them in creating pruning hooks. 
instruments of, of growth and of, of nurturing uh, the bounty of life. So please ask questions. Yeah. Well, we, we do have a, uh, a question. Um, I think that uh, the realities of the Israelis and Palestinians are, are, are obviously unique to a, that particular context. But here in Baltimore, we, we do um, have communities of mistrust and, um, and legacies built on that mistrust, especially um, given the, um, the, the realities of slavery, of, of racism, and, and how these realities play a role in everyday life that, that actually create some levels of suspicion. And so right. the question um, that, that one of our um, participants asked is, how do you, um, when you enter into dialogue, if there's no ethical component to draw you and ought to draw you to dialogue, how can um, an I thou um, dialogue rebuild um, lost trust? That you enter into relationship based on the fact that there is mutual suspicion. Um, in fact, in, in the United States, um, people, we live in a, in a hyper partisan environment in which people now live in within their own political realities. And if our orientation is to dialogue, um, presumably we have to give up some aspect of our own reality in order to, to enter someone else's. But what if that reality is something I don't trust? Okay. What if that worldview is something I, um, I see as an anathema or unethical to, to, to the way um, I see good relationships? For me. Right. So how, do, how does dialogue then rebuild where um, something was almost irretrievably lost? Okay. I'll, I'll reflect on that by my own experience here in the Holy Land. Um, yeah, um, please. <laughs> as a way of addressing those issues. Um, oh, it was maybe 30 years ago when I, when that was my initial student here in Jerusalem. Um, I participated in what we, we called dialogue groups, small groups of Israeli Jews and Christians, and but not everyone in Israel, in the state of Israel are Jews, uh, reaching out to Palestinians in the so-called occupied uh, territories. The Palestinians were very fearful, suspicious, or felt totally uncomfortable in, in welcoming the Israelis. Um, and it, the breakthrough became, came, I believe, in my own understanding, uh, when we indicated that we were willing to listen to their pain, go for the litany of your accusation as your horror. And as we listen, truly listen, not just to hear, there's a great difference between listening and hearing. And somehow after many, many weeks of this effort, the fact that we were listening compassionately, thoughtfully, like, internalizing their pain, experience their pain, somehow a wall broke. What broke is the fact that we understood the, the, the Palestinian experience of being abused, being disabused, being, I, I don't want to go into details, but the state of Israel was created with the expulsion of, and destruction of 470 and more Arab villages and small cities. A huge exile of Palestinians displaced. In Israeli, you go into an encyclopedia, we call these villages depopulated. And on those depopulated communities, uh, we have kibbutzim, Israeli communal farms, etc. Those are facts, they're brutal facts. Analogously, slavery was a horror. <laughs> You think it's, I'm certain you all know that story. Um, black residents of, 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 of Africa came from different communities, different traditions, different language groups, and have thrown into one horror cauldron of, of what we call slavery, ripped them apart from their own background, and of course, the, pre, and transition, the transportation of black uh, citizens of Africa, but residents of Africa. Large numbers died or killed before they ever got there. And then the brutal, brutal relationships. I just read today that Harvard University is now acknowledging that it, and allocating huge sums to, to, to inquire and, so to speak, unravel 
the university's relationship with slavery, Harvard University. Uh, so one of the first elements in that relationship is to acknowledge uh, the facts on both sides of the story. I'm now engaged with a friend, a Palestinian friend, and um, we're engaged in writing a book together on truth and reconciliation in the land of Israel slash Palestine. Reconciliation begins with acknowledging the facts. And acknowledging you. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. please, Ben. You want and to could say something? You, um, yeah, maybe maybe elaborate a little bit on um, how Buber sought this work when when he emigrated to, to Jerusalem in '38, and how um, and how his Zionism was connected to this this work of reconciliation that, that you're describing, mm -hmm. and maybe some of the legacy in in Israel um, and with with Palestinians of his thought, because I know that uh, that his that that. The book that you edited, The Land of Two Peoples of Buber's Writings, was translated into Arabic and had um, introductions by written by Palestinian intellectuals. And so just seeing his work in, in that area and, and its legacy today. Yeah. Well, the very title of the book in, in, in English and Hebrew has been translated into Japanese and, and Swedish, whatever. Um, the title is A Land of Two Peoples. First, we must acknowledge that there, there's another people in this land um, who have been here for hundreds of years, thousands of years, perhaps. In any event, they regard it rightly so as their home. My, my friend, uh, who I write, who engaged in writing this book, is a Palestinian. His family has been here for, for countless generations. And suddenly, with the establishment of the state of Israel, he's minority in his own land. He's... And in effect, a secondary, he has citizenship and all that, but in terms of the institutions, the ethos, the songs, the national anthem, the flag, etc., he's marginalized in a land that his family has been here for uh, just so long. Uh, his own family was displaced and they, they moved to the city of Haifa. That's not their ancestral home. The ancestral home is no longer Palestinian in terms of of identity, uh, in his memory, of course, uh, we have to acknowledge those those facts. They're brutal, sad facts. Likewise, the sad facts that Jews for thousands of years have regarded this as their home. The origins of the Jewish people are in this land. Um, the immediate impulse to return here was, of course, the scourge of anti-Semitism, uh, which began before Hitler. Of course, Hitler just what he called it, gave the final solution which meant, of course, to, um, to decimate the Jewish people, to liquidate them. Um, this, over the half of the population of Israel, with the establishment of the state of Israel, survivors. Survivors, of course, only a minority. And Palestinians have come to recognize that. I'll give you a very dramatic moment in that respect. Um, one of the participants in this initial dialogue groups eventually decided to come to the Holocaust Memorial in Jerusalem with his friends and family. And he wept, he wept. And then feeling the pain of the Jews and likewise, of course, the other way around. Um, that is essential um, truth, not only in terms of factual understanding, that's obviously easy. You can go, um, go to Google and tell you all the facts but the experience those facts, let those facts become part of your own pain, to share the pain of the other, to cry for Palestinians, to cry with Jews and Jews to weep with the Palestinians. And that's the beginning of reconciliation. The politicians will have their own solutions. <laughs> now, no. Buber was very committed to that, deeply so. We, um, we should not ignore the reality of the Palestinians. As he says, and I think you have it in your reading list, his exchange with, of Gandhi. Um, and it concludes, we love this land as deeply as the Palestinians love this land. We have to share our love for the land of Palestine, the holy land, if you wish, now going at the state of Israel. Um, so 
we, we have a question also in, in regard to interreligious dialogue. Um, if, if we can switch gears for a second. Um, so in, in the US in particular, when we engage in a religious dialogue, we often use language that, that is, um, that's Christian centric, right? So, you know, when people ask you, what is it that you believe? That's, that's obviously not a question that, that you and I would ask one another, although it'd be interesting, it wouldn't be the first question in dialogue. And so what ends up happening is that there's a power dynamic in that um, people who are not part of the majority have to um, be more accommodating in order to enter into a, a dialogical space. We, we're trying to change those conditions to, to create more of a, um, an equitable situation in which people's orientation to their own religious experience is just as important as the overall cultural um, movement. And so the, the, the question is then, given the realities of this, this asymmetry in language um, and experience in life, how, how does Buber's I and Thou um, a philosophy of Eindel sort of help us move toward a center in which um, all language and all experience can be equally shared and that not everyone has to translate to be um, hospitable. Yeah. Again, I'll reflect on my own experience. Um, when I was still uh, a fledgling professor at the Hebrew University in my early 30s, um, I joined with the Qadi of Jerusalem. The Qadi is the religious judge and leader uh, of Jerusalem. And then it truncated Jerusalem because at, the, at that point, the city was divided. Uh, Wajdi Tabali, the Qadi of Jerusalem. And we called it the Hope Seminar. And I being a, a young academic uh, would speak in pompous, pretentious language to the university, ontologies, epistemologies and all that. <laughs> And the Qadi, who was a much older man and much wiser man than myself, said, please, let us accept the model of musical appreciation. Let's listen to the soul of one another. Dialogue in the first place is not exchanging ideas and wrapping up in all sorts of uh, uh, pretentious or pontifical language, but just learning to listen to one another, like musical appreciation. So the Qadi would tell stories. And then I realized that's a tradition the Jews also have, particularly the Hasidim. We relate stories, stories I had drawn from the everyday experience. Uh, so the Hope Seminar began as it, it matured, and then I matured uh, with the assistance, the guidance of the Qadi um, to learning how to appreciate one another in terms of the body rhythm. You know, there's, there's an Arab uh, prayer, Muslim prayer, Akhba. Al Akhbar, which means God is great, and they and they repeat it, but if a certain rhythm, Al Akhbar, Al Afghanistan is a repetition, or or we're just noting this strange or intense cadence. But what is involved, of course, is creating a world in which the greatness of God enters their life, and it takes time to appreciate that, as well as learn to appreciate music. Um, Years later, I, I, was in, I was involved in another group called the Rainbow Group in Jerusalem, which included Jews and Christians and Muslims. And for a while, I was the president of that society. We would meet once a month, ultimately in a house of worship of one of the communities, Jewish or Muslim or Christian. And one of the exercises that were, when I was the, the I don't know, the, forgive me for using these terms, president, whatever, I, I was the instrumental organizer, <laughs> uh, and nothing more than that. One of the exercises is what we call secondary images. And we would ask Christians, how do, they, uh, how do you believe Jews see you as a Christian? Or Jews, how do you as a Jew believe Christians see you as, a Jew, uh, as, as, you, as you are, or Muslims? And it turned out, of course, a great dissonance. That's not the way we see you. Or perhaps that's the way we see you, and it should be perhaps corrected remedy. Uh, so dialogue in that sense was not simply exchange testimonies, uh, theological testimonies, or look for commonalities, but also tension. Uh, 
And that's one of the things is monotheism is really crucial and haven't, know, and haven't really been able to overcome is a sense of what we call supersessionism. We have the truth, but non-Jews don't maybe approach it, but don't have the truth. Or Christians, obviously, are not a true Israel, and Islam is now superseded, both Christianity and Judaism. That's what we call supersessionism, and that's intrinsic to our faith communities, but it's also a source of great conflict. So how do we live with our own theological sense of truth without demeaning the truth? the claims, the truth experience of others. And that's the challenge I understand is interfaith uh, dialogue is not to ignore and smooth over and, and try to smooth over with platitudes. We love you, you love me. Hanukkah is like Christmas. It's not. They just have to be calendrically somehow related, but the two different holidays and experiences. Um, but at the core is somehow to learn to live with each other without denying our religious truths and experience as Jews, as Christians, as Muslims. Um, that's the great challenge of interfaith dialogue as I understand it. Um, not to deny theological differences or faith differences in faith experience, and yet to honor the faith experience of others without the meaning of judging uh, those faith experiences. And, and there's no, I'm sorry. I, I oh no, so we, we have a, we have another question. Um, uh, so if, if you don't mind, I want to read the question. Um, Please. I, it's not very dialogical of me, but I so value the Buberian impulse to be in deep relationship, to develop a level of interpersonal intimacy necessary to create trust. That yeah. is hard work. In this time of pandemic and time of heightened global violence and pain, compassion fatigue dialogue fatigue is a real thing. Um, so what are some practices you have developed to cultivate the capacity, the stamina for dialogue, for trust building relationships? Um, cool question. Compassion. A, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm not certain I experienced that at all, but um, you know, I've been, uh, as, as, as Ben perhaps knows, I've been conducting a, a global seminar by Zoom um, that has reached um, 25 nationalities, thanks to the magic of, of uh, the cybernetic magic of, of, uh, of uh, Zoom. Uh, and we just completed one seminar over 10, 12 weeks, no, but more, 12 sessions on religious and existential and even political re responses to um, the, the pandemic. Uh, we began with of political uh, responses led by major individuals in the, uh, in the world of politics. Um, it, then we turned to poetry, uh, and then we had one session devoted to, to Muslim responses, how Muslims deal with the, uh, uh, the challenges of pandemic. Um, and Christians, we included um, Palestinian Christians, American, African-American, uh, Christians and uh, clergy from the Holy Land, Catholic. And then of course, we've been, uh, not of course, but we also had Jewish responses uh, from England, Bra uh, Brazil, uh, and the United States and Israel. And then we moved on to other philosophical, et cetera, responses. Um, and given the fact that we had this great variety of people from different ba backgrounds and experiences from Japan to Korea, to India, Turkey, uh, and along the way, all the way back through the United States into Argentina, um, we created some sense of, of a community of, uh, of concern that didn't, didn't overlook dissonance, dissonance in terms of the way we articulate problems, our understanding, or the differences of experience. Um, so it's not a question of compassion per se, it's ability to, to be, to maintain a, a fortitude, uh, a dialogical fortitude to listen to one another and to allow yourself to give expression to your own experience, your own pain, fear. Uh, it's not just compassion, it's the ability, the resolve to maintain, we can say an open heart or an open ear, ear um, um, and to be willing to, to be challenged uh, to, uh, 
on all levels. Um, that may, of course, so, nurture compassion, but I don't think it's compassion per se. So um, we, we have another question about, um, about a dialogue chat, uh, trap in that um, people who have an orientation to dialogue tend, well, maybe not always, but, but intend to do it well. Um, yeah. And part of the issue of dialogue is that it, it can be a transformational experience when, when, when you enter that relationship um, with, with the orientation that you just described, which, which requires some humility and some unmediated listening. Um, but there are a lot of people in the world that, that don't have these skills and aren't always interested in engaging in dialogue, yet um, we, we don't want to ignore people who are closed off. So what are some of the techniques that in, in just everyday life, um, at the marketplace even, that, that we can um, at least give ourselves the disposition to allow ourselves to hear others in a way that that's transform transformational, that they themselves see some benefit in um, in in wanting to be dialogical, and uh, and I'm careful not to say conversion, right? Because it's it, we're, we're, you're not converting to something, but it's a it's a desire to have that that sort of dialogical encounter as as something meaningful, right? As I alluded to, uh, to the experience of Buber and his friend, it, um, dialogical attitudes or postures is not, are, are not instant, instantaneous. Uh, I recall, but I hope I don't malign anyone, but a new age sort of gathering and we asked the, I was brought as of some sort of whatever, <laughs> and you get in a circle and everyone grabs one of them, I love you. <laughs> uh, that doesn't work. <laughs> There's no instantaneous. Uh, you can take pot or whatever they were willing to, <laughs> to somehow distribute in order to break down. But that's um, there's no magical chemical psychedelic. It's it's a journey, a very painful journey, um, and one um, one has to work on it. What's crucial in that respect is our teachers. Buber wrote a great deal about. Uh, pedagogy teaches a role of teachers on all levels um, but it's also a task of the teacher in, in herself his uh, his self to 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 exemplify the struggle to really listen to one another to be dialogical if you wish um, I saw one of one of the um, brief uh, chats uh, perhaps it was in uh, communities of mutual concern. Maybe that's the beginning. Let's acknowledge that we have shared concern and, and how to deal with that in order to let dialogue flower, but it has to be nurtured over time. Uh, and those who have the disposition to, let's call it talent or disposition to be dialogical, they should of course assume a major, major role. Buber perchance was not dialogical in disposition. He was, I'm certain you review this, but um, he experienced terrible pain that his mother, when he was three years old, just left his, his, his father and him without saying goodbye, without giving him a hug of her departure. And yet, towards the end of his life, 87 years old, he's, that pain remains with me. Maybe that's why he's so sensitive to the challenge of dialogue, creating trust. His mother betrayed him. And he was never, never able to overcome that, that wound. He was raised by his grandparents, traditional, and they didn't know how to talk about it. They left him festering with that pain. Where is my mother? Slowly, through relationships, he began to develop trust. Interestingly, he said, with animals. Animals are far more reliable. We have a cat in my home. Uh, Come home, the cat is always eager to meet me. But human beings are mercurial. Some days when I come home in a bad mood or I'm preoccupied, my wife is preoccupied, we have to negotiate again <laughs> our relationship. The cat is there, always jumping with joy. Uh, we're far more reliable than human beings. We're not reliable. Uh, uh, 
And Luber was aware of that. Um, and he struggled throughout his life. He was not dispositionally gregarious, open. He was guarded. The reason he had a beard, not for the narcissistic reasons I have a beard. Uh, he was born with a, a, uh, to, to, to a, a, a mishap in his birth with a twisted lip. He was very conscious of it. He had a slight lisp to give it the fact that he felt abandoned, deeply abandoned by his, his mother and his grandparents, not knowing really how to deal with that loss. So as soon as he, in adolescence, he began with a mustache, didn't quite cover it because the lip, because it was below. And then he had a beard. And people would take him to be a prophet. He said, no, no, this is just to protect me. Uh, we all have our vulnerabilities on various levels. Um, the way we encounter the world, sometimes those vulnerabilities are far more deep, deeper than others. Um, but to recognize that it's a question of struggle, but the point of departure is to acknowledge that we're both in need, both individuals are in need, we're all in need on one level or another, and certainly our, the conflicts that divide us, the conflicts are real, they can't be denied, they're politically real can be dealt superficially, just say, I love you. <laughs> that doesn't work. And pot's not going to help you either. As, as you still use that expression? Pot? What? A pot? pot. Yeah. Still... <laughs> All right. Well, this is being recorded, so I don't, I don't want to admit that I know or don't know. No, that, no, um, that I'll just say I won't term. recall. No, it's a term still <laughs> used. And it's still... Yeah, I... yeah. I, I should ask my teenage children. Um, I but still use term? it. <laughs> I still use the term. I still use the term. Um, right, already. It's like a <laughs> whatever. whatever it is. Yeah. But yeah. but I actually wanted to, to to press further on the interpersonal relationships of Buber because um, when when you read through his correspondence, um, at least I, I I never really saw, but presumably you had that um, he never uses the do form. Um, Very rarely. Very rarely. And that, that the sort of intimacy that, 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 that the do opens up between people, um, he seemed withdrawn yeah. from it. And so as a, as a teacher, and I, and I do remember reading a lot about um, his uh, misadventures uh, teaching texts at the, the Lair House. Um, yeah. But that this, yeah. this inability to, one need not be gregarious to, to show that they're open to dialogue, but that. Um... Yeah. But you have to remember, Ben, is that uh, it's almost a ceremony in, in German, is that you, you have to have a mutual agreement to, to turn to yeah. do. The Germans even have it, make it a verb, a dutzen. Um, and I lived in Germany off and on, and it's a great ceremony when you've reached uh, colleagues, even first day, the various dimensions. Uh, when you feel they're ready, so they'll refer to me uh, by my uh, my full name instead of saying Professor Mendesfoot. They'll call me Hey Paul, whatever. Uh, and when it comes that great moment, is it we're ready, Sudutsen, to dress one? That that takes a long time, and it has it's mutual. So Buba may have been ready for uh, to address someone in Purdue, but his partner was not. So it's not only he; <laughs> it's the relationship itself. See, that can't be judged in a way. He had relationships in which they were mutually such uh, do. Uh, give you an example how the way it attached to that word, uh, not in, uh, indicating names, but two very prominent professors in, in, in Jerusalem uh, came from the same neighborhood in, 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 in originally in, in Berlin, Grunewald. Um, they were the same age and they worked together in various form, even peace activists, uh, at one point, after this long friendship, they were still addressing one another in German with the more formal term Z. One of the, in the partners in that relationship inadvertently turned to the other and said, do the other person, how dare you? And broke off a relationship, a relationship of 40 years. How dare you? I just see an indication with the weight attached to it, and it has to be somehow mutually <laughs> negotiated. So it's not just Buber, uh, a great hesitation. Of course, in our generation in, Ger in Germany today, it's less severe, but still, you would not turn to a bank, uh, 
a, a, a doctor and say do, or, or a bank clerk, uh, or a teacher, God forbid. <laughs> uh, younger people in relationships are a bit looser about that, but it's still a, a, a new, a, and it's true in other European languages, a marker. What is crucial, however, for understanding Buber is that, um, that that word do, and what is interesting, I should have mentioned that before, translating it, Buber worked with a, a Presbyterian uh, scholar, Scottish scholar in the 30s and translating I and, I and thou. And they, in order to capture the religious dimension, the, uh, they translated the German do as thou, which is old English. It sounds so, but it meant to say, capture the, the unique of, of valence, semantic valence, significance, existential significance of this type of intimate relationship, as well as, of course, to say that it's relationship, the relationship we have with one another is a way of glorifying God or even address, allowing God to address us and, and with the challenge of living with one another with a mutual trust. Uh, God is the ground of trust, the source of trust, if you wish, uh, the signal of trust. Um, but it's it's a challenge. It's a as I indicated before, it's not a question of expert being an expert at, in dialogue. That would, that sounds crass. <laughs> it's blasphemous. There's nobody. We're all struggling um, on all sorts of levels, and we may not call it dialogue. That's just a term. Uh, but the, the relationship of trust of Mutual care, and as indicated in one of the the, uh, um, the messages, um, concern, uh, a concern to somehow to live with one another, you? with dignity and mutual respect, and indeed love, as Buber understood it, is mutual responsibility at all levels. Would you mind? Um... Focusing a little bit also on on Buber's view of God and in, in that that creation of trust because it um, talking about God is obviously complicated and um, and it's hard to to agree on terms on what what God might or or is um, in any sort of religious point of view but but Buber uses God particularly in in I and Thou um, and and uses God as a way of um, describing these types of relationships. Um, so could you talk a little bit about how that played a role in, in, in Buber's life and, and at least maybe indulge us on what a, a Buberian view of God might, might be? Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Buber uh, resisted the term theology, knowing the, uh, the, the logos, the wisdom of God. Um, and he tells the following story. Um, a month before the uh, outbreak of the First World War, which was in August 1914, he was visited in July by a, a very prominent uh, cleric uh, who was the, uh, the father confessor of the Kaiser, the, the German emperor. He himself was originally English, but a very prominent individual who supported this, the infant Zionist movement um, I had a strong sense of the second coming of the what we call in tradi Christian tradition, the Perusia. The, and this, uh, and Buber's still a young man, but already gained some prominence. And this man is Reverend Hechler, and he came excited. And he started quoting from the book of Daniel. It's coming. Uh, uh, and they had an expression in a type of literature we call apocalyptic, that there'll be birth pangs of the coming of the Messiah such as a woman goes with great pain and anguish before that glorious moment of giving birth, birth pangs of, the, of redemption. And this Rabbi Hechler, not Rabbi, Reverend Hechler, referred to the book of Daniel, one of the, actually the only apocalyptic book we have in the, in the, um, in the Hebrew Bible. Um, and he started quoting verses that's coming, <laughs> glorious for Jews, because he's gonna be returning to the land of Israel, on the wings of the Messiah, and full redemption will come. And Bubris was clearly not convinced. He was puzzled. And as Buber accompanied the, the Reverend Hechel to the train station, man, many decades older than him, Rabbi Hechel said, Tell me, here, here Buber, he had a doctor here, here Dr. Buber, do you believe in God? 
And, and Buba, of course, didn't want to offend the man. So he mumbled some ambiguity. And when he returned home, why couldn't I say, I believe in God? Or well, believe in the God as Reb Hechler had understood. And he said, years later, while in a in train ride, it suddenly occurred to him that to speak about God in the third person, God does this, God wants us to do that. I really don't know how to I comprehend that. But to address God in the second person with this intimate do, yes, I believe in God. I feel myself addressed by God. And I feel at the moments that I'm really um, challenged in life, I address God and I'm the second person. And that was crucial for Bubis understanding of I and thou. There's not a theology, a theologian in that strict sense. Um, but we do have a relationship to, to God and we have this partnership of God uh, in creating a world which is in accord with the first sentences of the book of Genesis. God created a world that is good, indeed, very good. But that very is up to us within a full uh, cognizance, consciousness of, of the contradictions of life, that there is death. There is pain, there is inequality, there is, the human beings are capable of extraordinary evil as we witness today, gratuitous evil. Um, but we not, cannot flee before evil. Um, we must address it and seek to heal. And the healing means to heal ourselves and to the process of healing um, the world about us. So we are, we only have a few minutes left. Um, and so I wanted, before I, I close out the, um, our, our time with, with Paul, to give Paul an opportunity just to, um, to share some parting thoughts. Um, I saw in the chat that, that the question of, um, should, ever, should, should one ever address God as do? Um, I think the simple answer is yes, but um, yeah. but um, but Paul, do you do you want to uh, leave us with some some parting thoughts? Well, I'll um, pick up on your, your last comment, but I do you know fact is that uh, in prayer, in, in German prayer, yeah, okay, you're just using the lex the, uh, the lexical indications of uh, of what is at hand. Of course, we you asked about addressing one another, Purdue. We were hesitant, we're uncertain how we can relate, to have, how we can reach out to one another with the intimacy, the trust, the mutual trust indicated by the, the word do. But when we turn to God in German, it's always do. God can be con considered the king of the universe, <laughs> uh, uh, the source of all creation. In the Hebrew, we call it Ribbon uh, the, the compassion, the enjoy, just, I know this, in Arabic, you know, the, uh, uh, that's the, 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 the first surah in, in the Muslim tradition. Oh, God is almighty. God, El Akbar, Al Akbar. And yet we turn to God as Purdue. Um, God is the assurance, if you wish, the ground, the fancy philosophical term, ontological, right basis. Forget about the, the term ontological unless it inspires you. <laughs> uh, but um, yes. Um, so, so Paul, I, I want to thank you for, for taking time out of your evening to, to join us today in Baltimore and Wisconsin and wherever else people are um, Zooming in from. Um, I just wanted to quote very quickly from, from Pirkei Avot in the Mishnah, where um, we have a, a responsibility to find ourselves a teacher and to uh, acquire a friend um, and to, to judge everybody favorably. Um, and I, because I have everyone here, I'm going to, to just say that I'm, I'm really grateful that I found myself this particular teacher. I'm grateful that I found myself this particular friend and that, um, and that the hard work of having to judge people favorably is, is something that, that um, I know that Paul inspires me to continue to do. 
um, and that we we each in our own way can can at least attempt to do that hard work together. Um, I I say that having like had a difficult morning and probably said things that I probably regret. <laughs> <laughs> regretted but I, I think that that is in um in the life of dialogue so i want to just take this moment to, to thank paul um and uh you'll, you'll all be getting a, a survey so that we can um make these 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 formats better even though this was the best it could possibly ever be for all time just kidding but I'm grateful that all of you were, were here. And, um, and again, I'm really grateful to, to Paul Mendes for, um, and one day, Paul, I, I will tell you the story about when I made the mistake of calling my German teacher or using the do form. And <laughs> she said, despite excelling in grammar and my confidence in speaking and, and everything else <laughs> that I had created a mistake that was so awful that, that I shouldn't get the grade that I was getting. <laughs> and the, the shame that I, I carried with me may, may still even be there. So I know, <laughs> but, but thank you. <laughs> I thank you and I, I thank your, your community. Yeah, no, thank you. it's, it's wonderful that you all, all could be here. And mm -hmm. if, if you have a few minutes after everyone right. disperses just, out into the wish, cyber world. We're still in the midst of Ramadan. So I'd like to wish uh, your uh, Ramadan, our uh, Muslim friends, um, Ramadan Karim, may you, God prove to be generous to you as we are generous to God. Um, so Ramadan Karim. Shukran. Okay, thank you. Oh, so thank you, everyone. Um, you'll be getting an email follow-up soon, and, and thank you for, for joining us. Thank you.